getting late in the morning, isn't it? All right, let me start with a question. How many of you are regular users of Uber? Raise your hand. How many of you are regular users of Facebook? Getting a little bit more. Airbnb? All right, and here's the real hard question. How many of you have checked your phone in the last 30 seconds? All right. So it's amazing that 10 years ago, almost no one would have raised their hand. Almost none of these capabilities existed 10 years ago. And now, these companies that represent these capabilities and their peers are some of the largest companies in the world. Apple, the largest company in the world, period. Uh, Facebook, largest media company. Google, I mean Uber and its peers, largest transport company, Airbnb, one of the largest hospitality companies in the world. And collectively, these companies represent $1.4 trillion in market value. $1.4 trillion. Apple is worth about $800 billion. Facebook is worth about $500 billion. Last uh, capital raise, Uber was about $60 billion. Airbnb at $30 billion. That $1.4 trillion is a stark testimony to the opportunity to innovate. Because these technologies were not invented by these companies, but they became available, and these companies took advantage of it. Innovation is hard. Innovation is really hard. But that's why there's opportunity. Because the companies that can take advantage of those capabilities can create value. They can solve problems. They can make the world a better place. They can serve customer needs. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you are satisfied with the innovation capabilities of your company? And it's not just in healthcare. Innovation is hard all in every industry. So a uh, um, McKinsey study last year of global, of global executives found that 94% of, of executives were dissatisfied with the innovation performance in their company. So I know it's hard in healthcare, but it's hard all over. So this question of innovation at the, at the intersection of technology and strategy has been the focus of my work in my entire career. I've written four books on this topic, and what I want to do this morning is just from that research, from that experience, to draw out for you three lessons. Three lessons to think about how you go about the business of innovation and the process of innovation. Three lessons that looks at a lot of winners and a lot more losers and tries to understand what's the difference between the winners and the losers. So you are the change agents shaping the future of healthcare and connected health. What I want to do is help to provoke your thinking and maybe assist you just a little bit in your work. So lesson number one, embrace the gap. And this is the gap I'm talking about. It's the difference between what companies tend to do and the capabilities that are created by exponentially changing technologies. Right? Because it's very human nature for all of us, whether we're in a startup or in a very large company, to focus on the things that we know really well. Successful companies are optimized around their current processes, their current products, their current problem set, their current customers, their current systems. Their entire, that represents their culture. And it's human nature to want to change really slowly and not to put at risk what is successful. But as we all know, technology increases in this capability at an exponential rate. So over time, the simple thing that happens is a vacuum, a gap uh, gets created and markets abhor vacuums. And somewhere, somehow, somebody will figure out to, to do something that's possible as opposed to what's being done today. And those new products, those new capabilities are the ones that come in and disrupt marketplaces. They create new categories. They ex disrupt existing competitors. So as an example, Kodak literally invented the sensor inside digital cameras. They hold the patent. Yet for 25 years after the invention of that sensor, they spent all their effort on using digital technology to augment their existing film, chemical, and paper business. It's not that they didn't understand digital. 
It's not that they weren't creating more and more patents and more revolutions with that technology. It's how they chose to use it. So as late as the late 1990s, Dig uh, Kodak spent $500 million on a new camera system that had a digital sensor and a screen. It also used film. Do you know what you could do with that sensor and that, cam and, and that screen? You couldn't save the picture. You couldn't transfer the picture. What you could do was you could preview the shot and tell the processing plant how many copies you wanted of the prints. Not because they couldn't do those other things, but because they were in a business that was creating 60 to 70 percent margins on film, chemical, and paper. They were a global leader, monopoly in most countries. So why would they move from a business model of making 60 to 70 percent to a business model of selling cameras that was making 15, 20, 30 percent? And it made all the sense in the world in the short term for them to focus on augmenting their business model as they knew it, staying on that incremental line. But of course, as we all know, other people came in, took that raw technological capability, and put them out of business, literally. And you know, the, the, the annals of history are littered with once great companies that had no problems innovating on that faster, better, cheaper line and were killed by competition that used the same technology differently. So if you look at the world today, there are a number of technologies that I believe are disrupting every information intensive industry, including yours. And these are the technologies that all the speakers before me have talked about. And these are the technologies that every company in this room are using. But how are you using it? Are you embracing the gap or are you staying on that incremental line? I believe in order to be successful in digital innovation, you need to embrace the gap. So lesson number two. Embracing this technology, looking at the gap, and thinking big. Successful companies are the ones that dare to explore a wide range of possible solutions. They're willing to consider the possibility that somebody else might take new capabilities and put them out of business. They're willing to explore their deepest, darkest, doomsday scenarios. And they're also willing to start from a clean sheet of paper to ask the question, what can I do that's needed as opposed to what can I do that's easy for me to do. So let me give you some examples. And what I want to do is first dive into cars and transportation as an example. Cars and transportation for three reasons. One, this is an industry that's, that's been dominated by the same companies for the last 100 years. So to a certain extent, if disruption can happen in auto, it can happen anywhere, even in healthcare. Second. It's an industry that impacts a wide range, a wide swath of our economy. In the U.S. alone, uh, automotive-related spending is, is, is over $3 trillion. Globally, it's over $10 trillion. And there's large ripple effects in the changes of, in, of the technology in this area. And third, of course, we're all customers, so we can relate to this, uh, relate to the, this, this category. So the aspect of auto business I want to focus on this morning is this one. Each year in the U.S., last year, more than 30,000 people were killed in automotive accidents, involving um, 6.2 million accidents that involved more than 10 million cars. Almost 2.5 million people were injured. Worldwide, more than a million people were killed, and more than 50 million people were injured. The economic costs of those accidents are mind-boggling. More than $270 billion in the U.S. in direct costs, and if you factor in quality of life, according to the U.S. Highway uh, Safety Administration, more than $870 billion. And the situation is not getting any better. We s invest a ton of money into, into safety technology, and it looked like the numbers were plateauing and dropping for a bit, and in the last couple of years, fatalities have gone up. And 94% of those accidents are due to human error. 94%. And one way to think about that 94% is that it's the poor interaction between the customers and the tools that we sell to them. The poor interaction between customers and the tools that we sell to them. So how could you think about the technologies that, that we're talking about and address that problem? 
Well, this is, as you know, one of the things that's going on in, in the automotive industry. There's a, there's a worldwide race to build driverless cars, autonomous vehicles. Combination of analytics, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, Internet of Things. The same technologies that you're grappling with to turn them into driverless cars. Here's a look at how some of this stuff is working right now. Since 2009, our team at Google has been developing fully self-driving technology and testing it on real city streets every single day until after more than a million miles, we were ready to take a big step forward. In 2015, we completed the world's first truly driverless ride on public roads. Just a person in a car, no steering wheel, no pedals, navigating everyday traffic. Well, I've never been in Austin, Texas. Now I'm driving in Austin, Texas. experience for me to be alone in a car. A very important segment of my life was cut away when my vision failed, and a self-driving car would give me a huge part of my life back. This is just the beginning. And it's all happening really fast. One way of thinking about it is that we spent decades thinking about how we could create technology to help drivers. Anti uh, lock brakes, collision avoidance systems, um, lane departure warnings, a host of technologies that cost a lot of money to help drivers. That's the incremental line. The exponential line and fill in the gap was to say, let's just take the weak link out of the system and remove the driver. Right? Something that the automotive industry never contemplated. When Google started a self-driving car project, some automotive companies took, took out Super Bowl ads to ridicule the effort. And now it's happening really, really quickly. Uh, both GM and Ford have each spent more than a billion dollars acquiring companies to get into this space. Volvo has pledged that by 2020, no one will die in their new cars. And the ultimate proof, how many of you have driven cars in Boston? Boston is starting the testing of self-driving cars. My view is that if it can work in Boston, it can work anywhere. <laughs> right? And just yesterday, uh, Delphi, the big automotive uh, supplier, bought a little company that's less than two miles away from here in this space, Nutonomy, uh, with less than 100 employees for over $400 million. That's how this space is heating up. So how can we think big in healthcare? $3.3 trillion, as big as the automotive industry. Now, I don't have to tell you in this room that there are immense opportunities for using technologies, connected health technologies, to make healthcare faster, better, cheaper, to improve quality, reduce costs. You're working on that. That's good. What if you could think even bigger? What if you could ask, like, uh, Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg have done is, what if we could apply what we know, could we cure all diseases in our children's lifetime? Right. A highly aspirational goal, what could we do if we're focused on that goal, sort of like eliminating the driver rather than making the car better? But I actually want to spend a few minutes and offer you even a bigger aspiration. As Russ Acoff, the philosopher and, um, and systems thinkers observed a number of years ago, the healthcare system in the United States, it's not a healthcare system. It's a sickness and disability care system. We focus on sick and taking care of the disabled. And because of the business models of the ecosystem, most of the innovation, most of the solutions we build are focused, as Tim Cook of Apple said, on getting the reimbursement not necessarily thinking about, in the end, what's the best thing to help the patient. That's the economics of our business. It's hard to avoid. But what if for a moment you could think really big? And here's a edit that 
Karen Kometic, at my friend American Medical Association, has made, which I think is highly aspirational to Chan and Zuckerberg's question. What if we could prevent and cure all diseases in our children's lifetime? What if we could prevent and cure all diseases in our children's lifetime? And one way of thinking about it is that Karen is talking about that exponential gap, right? Care is faster, better, cheaper, focused on the incremental. We have a whole slew of technologies that you know very well that may enable a different kind of problem to be solved. Can we embrace that gap? So let me give you an example of one way this might look if we thought about transformation in a different way. You well know that diabetes is, is at alarming levels and growing uh, very fast. It's not the largest killer right now, but it is the fastest growing killer uh, in terms of chronic disease. It's $825 billion globally spent um, treating diabetes. In China alone, 500 million people are pre-diabetic. 500 million people are pre-diabetic. If 20 or 30 percent of those people or, or more become diabetic, that's going to overwhelm the healthcare system of that country. In the U.S., 30 million people are already diabetic. We spend probably over $250 billion each year taking care of, the, of their sickness, that disease. And one in four of them don't know they have it, which means that later, the ravages of that disease will be greater and the cost will be higher. Now, let me just say right now, treating the ravages of diabetes, taking care of the sick is absolutely necessary. It's a noble thing to do. But I also think that it's noble, necessary, and not very much done to think about the 86 million people in the U.S. that are pre-diabetic. Nine out of 10 of them don't know it. Most doctors don't screen for it. Almost none of them, less than 1%, will ever get referred to clinically proven diabetes prevention programs. That's the transformation that's possible if we think about prevention rather than just cure, care. Right? If we transform the system, we would focus innovation, new products and services, as much on or more on the 86 million to prevent becoming cost as on the 30 million who need that care today. And of course, I want to recognize that a lot of people are working in this effort. Um, I have the, the privilege of helping the American Medical Association a little bit under diabetes prevention program. There are great things going on to why. I know OMADA is here, um, a online diabetes program, and a lot of health systems are working on this problem. But how many, for how many of the organizations in the healthcare ecosystem does prevention rise to anywhere near the top of the priority list? It does not. It's important, but is it important enough to get the attention? So much more needs to be done. So that's how one way of we can think bigger in healthcare, and of course there are a number of other chronic diseases that need the same attention. So lesson number three, successful innovators do not fall in love with the big ideas. They don't base their efforts on hope and aspiration. They both base their efforts on data right, and experience. So let me give you an example of that. Gordon Bell, uh, one of the lead engineers at Digital for a number of years, has, has a great quote, a demo is worth a thousand pages of the business plan. One of the things you have to do when you have these great ideas is not to do what big companies tend to do, which is to do big planning, to do a lot of, lot of analysis, spreadsheets built based on hope instead of data, uh, long project plans, lots of money, and go for it or die. So as an example, when Google started a self-driving car project, Larry Page and Sergey Brin said to the team, okay, see if you can th drive 1,000 miles. See if you can build a car that can drive 1,000 miles. And I don't want just any 1,000 miles. I want interesting miles, like can you cross the Bay Bridges? Can you take a nice drive down Pacific Coast Highway? Can you navigate Nar Lombard Street? And it was only after they did that 1,000 miles that then um, they were told, well, can you drive 100,000 miles? And it wasn't until after they drove 100,000 miles 
that any of us even heard about this project. They would started thinking about the long term. And since then, they've gone on this approach that said, it's not really about how much effort we put into it or how far we, ahead we plan. It's about the, how quick we can learn, the cycle time of learning. So as other companies like Delphi, who is jumping into the, the space by buying a 100-person startup for $400 million, Google has gone through seven generations of their cars. They've learned really, really fast. They're now driving at 20 to 25,000 miles a week on real roads. They've logged over 3.5 million miles of learning. Last year in California, which is sort of the epicenter of this work, they've driven more than 30 times the number of miles of all their competitors combined. They created a mechanism for learning that's going to be really, really hard to catch, catch up. They've taken all that, those, that data from driving the roads and put it into simulation programs that allow them to drive about 8 million miles a day in, in simulator. So they can test new software, test, new, test, uh, test alternative use cases. Because the car doesn't actually know when it's on a real road or in a computer. It just looks at the data. And Google has put in more than 3 billion miles in, on simulator. So they have a process for learning. Just this summer, they started a program where they're driving real people in, in cars in, in uh, Phoenix. And there are rumors they're about to announce a commercial uh, effort in Arizona as well. So the thing to remember about innovation is not about first mover or fast follower. It's about the fact that the fastest learner are the ones that win. So, to summarize, three questions I want to leave with you with. One, are you embracing the gap? You know about the technologies. I don't have to tell you about them. But are you embracing the gap between faster, better, and cheaper, and what's available exponentially? Are you thinking big enough? And are you set up to learn fast? Because you're the ones who will shape the future of connected health. And I wish you the best in that effort. So this is not a conducive form for, uh, for questions. Um, I'll be outside at the uh, book signing table at 1130. Please feel free to come by. And I'd love to talk to you more about this. And I'd be also be happy to send you a copy of my slides. If you would like, just drop me an email. Thank you. <laughs>